Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Very soon, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Big finish. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We're going to see. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you, and so do I. God loves you, and so do I. Good morning. Welcome. So I'll just do this to all our neighbors. God loves you, and so do I. What do you think, Eddie? Absolutely. All right. Hey, it's good to see you all here this morning, and uh, you had choices. We're glad that you chose to be here. That's a good thing. Well, what do we got going on here, Pastor Eddie? We've got a lot of exciting things going on. I want to remind you of our Growing Young survey. Um, We are still in that phase right now. The team, we're in the listening phase, and so we want to hear about your experience. How do you experience our church? How do you think we're doing Um, at embracing and loving young people. So if you haven't taken that survey yet, it'll only take you 10 minutes. Um, We would love, love, love to hear your opinion um, as we move forward. Uh, That's important. Um, Okay, and then we got a rummage sale coming up for the school. And uh, this has always been a big event. If you have items to bring in, um, we will be receiving them the week before June 4th, so starting on, on that Sunday before, um, you, can, you can arrange to have your stuff here. Uh, this, this really benefits the Worthy Student Fund and helps to support our school, which is our most important mission field. Amen to that. Uh, we've also got another Youth Vespers and Game Night coming up May 15, 6 to 9. That's going to be at Journey Christian School. So if you are from 7th grade all the way up to 12th grade, come out, um, enjoy food, fellowship, and games. All right. And then uh, graduation's coming up, and we have, I believe, six, six graduates out of, our, uh, out of our school this year. I think that's a new record. Uh, but if you know of, uh, if you have family members that are graduating from any of the grades um, in terms of uh, high school, college, um, let, let Cheryl know. And we want to recognize all of our graduates uh, coming up here at the beginning of June. So um, please do that. And then, yeah, you know, one of the things that, that when you flip on the light switch and the lights go on, you don't, you don't pay any attention to it. But when you're walking into a dark room and you flip the lights on and they don't go on, you notice it. And um, if, if the sound starts squealing or you, know, you drop out or something like that happens, um, everybody tends to look back and say, what's going wrong? But you know, we have a great group of people working back there that are behind the scenes And one of the things that I learned about our technology, it was top-notch at one time, but it is dated. It's wearing out, and it also is labor-intensive. Our volunteers are putting in more hours than they need to, and they're they're just hardworking, and they don't really complain. But this is an opportunity for us to support them. I mean... You, you know, Ed, Eddie, you're, you're kind of close to all this. What's, what do you see going on? Yeah, um, we, uh, we, we need to upgrade our soundboard. Um, we would love to be able to upgrade to the point where we could live stream our services rather than um, having our tech team stay hours after the service editing and uploading a video. And so we are asking and begging for your money. Um, so on your way out today, 
Um, if you want to just drop your entire credit card in the mailbox, we accept those. Uh, social security, um, oh, whatever oh. form, checks, oh, cash. Man. Okay, um, I'm going to stop you there. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, the point is that this would show a great thank you to our some of our most dedicated volunteers. They need our support. They need our vote of thanks. And the way we can do that is by being generous in giving. You can do that online. Um, we have, uh, uh, our treasurer has put a special line. So if you're doing your online offering, you can uh, contribute to uh, technology or do all those other things that he was talking Absolutely. about in our white mailbox. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to continue on in our worship. I pray that you will have a blessed and deep experience with the Lord today. Amen. And like our technology, our soundboard lights and so forth, I too am old and dated. So I persuaded my young friend Zach Parks to come up and lead worship. Everybody say hi, Zach. Hi, Zach. And speaking of old and dated, I persuaded my friend Leif to come play trumpet with us. Everybody say hi, Leif. Hi, Leif. So, uh, I'm very excited to worship this morning. I wanted to tell you a little story. It's a short one, so be patient. Uh, 2004, a bunch of us from here, many of whom don't attend here anymore, uh, went to Africa. And we went to the country of Zambia. And I was fortunate enough to be invited along and played music and so forth. And the song we're about to do, I taught them. And a lot of them didn't speak English, but I taught it to the youngsters. And I would have a couple of hundred, sometimes more, youngsters come every evening to the meeting. And so I taught them this song, and it goes, oh, 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 heaven is in my heart, and then a few other words. But after about four or five days, I'd be walking through the jungle, and I'd hear from far away, oh, 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 oh. And I'd go, heaven is in my heart, and we'd laugh, and Pretty soon I'd see him come out of the trees or out of the grass, and it was very, very cool. And this song has always stuck with me, and it's a way that we showed that we loved each other and we were working together toward a common goal. So I would invite you to join us. Uh, you're welcome to stand. You're welcome to sit. However it is you feel comfortable worshiping. And let's sing Heaven Is In My Heart. Sing it again now. Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart. Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart. One more time. Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart. The kingdom of our God is here. Heaven is in my heart. The presence of his majesty. Heaven is in my heart. And in his presence joy abounds Heaven is in my heart The light of holiness surrounds Heaven is in my heart Everybody sing it Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart Sing it again now Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart A little louder Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart Again Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Heaven is in my heart. I once was lost, but now I am found. Heaven is in my heart. I once was blind, but now I see. Heaven is in my heart. Cause my Jesus lives inside of me. Heaven is in my heart. Everybody sing it. Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart. Sing it again now. Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart. Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart. One more time. Oh, 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 oh. Heaven is in my heart. We are a temple for his throne. Heaven is in my heart. And Christ is the foundation stone. Heaven is in my heart. He will return to take us home. Heaven is in my heart. 
The spirit and the bride say, come, heaven is in my heart. Everybody sing it. Oh, 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 heaven is in my heart. Sing it again now. Oh, 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 heaven is in my heart. Lift your voices. Oh, 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 heaven is in my heart. Big finish. Oh, 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 heaven is in my heart. Amen. Sing with us this morning. You give life. You are the
before you came along, future. Here's a little different flavor on it. We are one in the spirit. that God created us and God said in our image we are built to be people of community because God, God's self is a community scripture tells us may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another accordance with Christ Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit are things of community, love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness is in there. This morning, sing with us as we ask God to continue to be a part of adapting our hearts to be those that love each other
Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart. Change my heart, oh God. Amen. These guys rocked it. Thank you. Praise God. I want to share an amazing fact with you folks today as we begin our prayer. Bioluminance is an amazing phenomenon in which a chemical reaction in living organisms produces light without any appreciable heat. This cool light usually green or blue, results from a chemical reaction involving specialized phosphorus containing molecules in the organisms. Bioluminance is found in creatures ranging from common firefly, glowworm, to some species of bacteria, algae, and fungi. This built-in lighting system can also be found in many invertebrate animals like squid, jellyfish, worms, crustinians. In fact, in the dim midwater or twilight region of the ocean between 200 and 1,000 yards deep, 90% of all animals, including shrimp, produce light. This organic light is produced in some ways like the popular luminous glow sticks. When a glow stick is snapped, two chemicals mix, react and create a third substance that gives off light. Marine organisms do essentially the same thing within special organs or cells. One substance, luciferin, is mixed with an enzyme, 
luciferous, and a new molecule is formed that gives off the glowing blue-green light. Science has barely touched the surface when it comes to replacing this efficient light production. Bioluminous is used for a large variety of reasons. Some deep sea fish are equipped with freshly organs that produce luminance which prey is attracted. The flashes emitted by male and female fireflies are used as species specific signals for mating. It is also an obvious form of communication species in the dark environment. Light can also be used to repel predators. The sophisticated squid can control when light is produced and even its color and intensity. Most sea creatures, like the microscopic drifting algae, have simple light producing systems that are simulated by water movement. This is what causes the glow in the wake of a large ship passing through the water during blackout conditions in war, more than one pilot has found his way back to the aircraft carrier by following the green glow behind a moving ship. God's church can be a moving ship, creating a trail of light to lead others to heaven. Even our own lives should glow with light to attract others to Jesus. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I didn't realize until just the other day, <clears throat> we as Seventh-day Adventist members are 200, or I'm sorry, 22 million strong. And unfortunately, out of the 22 million strong that we are, only 6% of us are in the United States. The rest are spread out throughout the world. Would you take a moment and bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, we have a lot of work to do, Father, as your children. You've called us to be the light, and yet there's so much going on in our own nation that we really don't need to go out throughout the world searching to speak to others about your kingdom and your love. We have it right here in our own backyards, starting with our own family members, our own neighbors, our own co-workers, the people at the checkout stand at the grocery store and even at the bank teller. Father, may our hearts be open to see the love of Jesus that he has given to us to be the light to others. May you empower us. May you strengthen us. As today starting, that each one of us leave this parking lot and we enter into that mission field. Lord, you've given us a, a quite of a mountain to climb. And may each and every one of us as brothers and sisters take on this responsibility to spread the gospel here in our own country. We have so many lost souls wandering around out there. And we're here for a purpose to glorify you. So may each one of us take you seriously when you ask us to be the light and go out and do what you've commanded us to do, which is share your gospel. Heavenly Father, we love you and we ask for all the strength from Jesus to be able to do this. We ask it in your Holy Son's name. And everybody will agree by saying, Amen. Thank you. So what is community? What is it about community? I mean, we all are hardwired for this need and this desire to belong to a group of people. Community is, is just at the core of our being, something that we have 
that we have a need for. We have a need in families. We have a need for friendships. We have a need to belong to others. And I'd, I'd like to suggest that what we can look at uh, community as a compound word, a common unity. Common unity. And what is it that brings people together into a sense of community, into a sense of belonging? Well, I'd like to suggest that what we have is a two-part um, or two perspectives of what can draw people together as, as a group. For one is love, and the other is selfishness. You see, love is the basis of the Christian church. It is meant to be that thing that draws different people, diverse people from all different backgrounds and, and cultural um, identity and all different ways of um, socioeconomic layers and uh, job and occupation layers and um, just different backgrounds coming together under the banner of love. Or selfishness. Selfishness can make a community as well. And as we look down through history, we, we can see that selfishness expressed in, in, um, in various coalition ways to bring people together has been used uh, to propagate war. That we identify an enemy, we dehumanize them, we give them nicknames, we make them the enemy, and then we come together to war against them for a righteous cause. And we can see in cultures where there are cultures that have been divided because there is ethnic cleansing, because we have made an enemy and it's driven out of selfishness under the labels of hatred, um, justice, any number of things. But ultimately it boils down to selfishness, selfishness which is another word for sinfulness. You see, our human nature is sinful, and it tends to label and identify people that are different for, from us. It, it comes to this place where there's an us and them. Us and them. That we are okay and they are not okay. And, and so our fallen nature, our sinful nature, tends to to make community out of people that are similar to us and enemies out of those who are different from us. And we see that used as a device, even in our common culture with media and whatever, we are able to create an enemy and the right people. And in, in, in this culture today, we are seeing more and more angry rhetoric more heated words, more divisiveness that is trying to break apart. But that is the antithesis of what God's love is all about. God's love is to bring people together. It's to bring people from a them to a we, that we draw together as a group of we. <laughs> Consider what Paul was inspired to write about the expressions of love. And we find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, and I'm just taking one part of it. But think about the words that Paul uses as the, as the uh, active element of what love does and what love looks like and, and, and the power of that love. Paul writes this, Love is patient and kind, Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Notice again, this is all opposite of selfishness. It keeps no record. It is not irritable. Oh, I, I think I lost that one yesterday. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, 
but love will last forever. In another version, love never fails. You see, it is, it is this ideal of love, and when I read all of, all of what Paul has written here, understand that what he came from was a culture of us and them. The Jewish, the Jewish people had become a proud subculture in, in the world. And instead of being a light to the world, they began to get focused on the purity of who they were and the dirtiness of all others. They even subdivided within the, the um, ethnic Jewish peop- culture that there were those who were not as good as those who were pure. And, and so there was hatred. Even we see this with the Pharisees and the Sadducees <laughs> didn't think much of each other. We see the Samaritans who were considered half-breeds. So all of this is, is working against the whole idea of what God designed for, for community. And I like what Zach shared, that God is we. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the, the kernel of community. You can't have community with just two. Community needs to be three or more. And, and so here we have this ideal of love that is spoken of. And as I look at, at this description, I think to myself, oh my goodness, I am not scoring very high on this measure of love. I have moments where I am in a good place, but I have other times that I'm not. But here is the heart of what brings together community. This is where we find people valued, people respected for what they, what they are and who they are and who God made them to be, where we feel safe in that community, where we feel loved in that community, where we feel value in that community. A place where, where we know that we are going to be accepted for who we are. I mean, that's what God intended. And, and when you think about what Jesus was willing to do out of his love for all of us, that he came into a world that didn't want him because we were more important to him than life itself, and that he came into the world, he says, you are worth it, so that he could build community out of the brokenness that had happened in, in the, the people of God before his time arriving into this world. God wants us to be different than what's happening out there. He wants us to be unique and special and attractive to people who are looking for something authentic and real that they want to be a part of. God wants us as a community to be a place where people can experiment in in their spiritual life and not be condemned and shunned and broken by criticism. God wants this place to be the safest place in the world. A community where people can come and feel, feel safe enough to grow. A place where people can feel safe enough not to put on an image. And, and where people don't have that nagging thought of, if they really knew who I was, they would not want me. God wants his community to be real. The Apostle Paul grew up in that community of us and them. And the, the thing that happened on the road to Damascus is, is the most amazing thing. Paul was blinded by Jesus when, when he fell off his horse and there was a blinding light and he lost his physical sight for a time so that his spiritual eyes could see the truth. And Paul coming out of an us-them mentality, and he was really practiced at it. He knew how to take care of those who were different, even approving of their murder. And that's what, that's what 
selfishness and sin does. It ultimately murders. He was given the mission of we. (laughs) I love that Paul, as a dyed-in-the-wool, pure Jew, a Pharisee of Pharisees, uh, uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, as to the law, faultless, as he talks about in, in Philippians chapter 3. He, he goes from being driven by his humanity and his fallen nature to being drawn by the love of Jesus. He experiences God's love. He experiences the love and acceptance of Jesus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? when all I want to do is draw you into my arms. And he is given the mission to go out into the world, the mission that had been forgotten about by his people, to go into the world as a light to the Gentiles. And with the impossible task of taking two diverse cultures and bringing them together under the love of God, but that's what God's love does. God's love brings different people together into into an otherworldly experience. Because when God's love is allowed to roll free and be spread around, it's an amazing thing. You see, God's love, as Paul talks about uh, uh, God's love, it's agape love. Agape love is always others-centered. God's love is other-centered. That's why in John 3.16 we read, For God so loved, agape the world, that He gave His only Son. You see, agape love is always others-centered. That whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Agape love is the heart and soul of, of what we are as a people as we receive the love of God. You see, as I've said so many times, it's that vertical connection with God. God pours His love into us. It is foreign to us in our fallen nature. He pours His love into us, and in this vertical relationship, God pours His love into us. That love responds back to God as we worship Him as we get to know more about Him, as we experience His love, it does something inside of us. It changes us from the inside out. It is a supernatural process. It does something in us that we cannot do for ourselves. Religion of the past has focused on trying to trying to control our behaviors so that we fit into the image of what others expect of us. But the the love of God has a supernatural power to transform us from the inside out so that we begin to see things in a new way and we respond in a healthy way. It's how God makes us healthy and transforms us into a new creation. So the Apostle Paul, who experienced that love of God, all of a sudden he begins to spread that love horizontally. You see, it's like us too. When we receive God's love, because He's always pouring it out, but when we receive God's love and reflect that love back to Him, it can't help then but become that horizontal element that spreads out to others. The way we treat others. The way we are with others. And the way we just are. It's who we become it's not who we, who we try to be. It's who we become. And so this Paul, who met Jesus and, and experienced his love, writes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. See, that's, that's the antithesis of what love does. To live in our sinful nature is corrosive to community, To live in love is nurturing to community. And so he says, don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Because agape love is always other-centered. 
And how does this work in a community? If I am selfishly focused because of my sinful nature, I am always looking for what I can get advantage of, what I can manipulate, what I can attain for myself, what I can do to make myself fuller of whatever it is I want, to control more people, to, to, to be someone who dies with the most toys, like the bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys wins, <laughs> wins nothing. But he says, use your freedom to serve one another in love. How does that work in a community? If God's love is perfectly being represented in a community, I am taking care of others. I am concerned for others. I love others. But look what comes back. Others are concerned for me. Others take care of my needs. When one, one part of the body is hurting, the other parts respond to take care of that one that is in need. It's what God intended, is that we would draw together and take care of one another, be concerned for one another, love one another, forgive one another, accept one another, build one another up. It is the kind of place that God wants us to be. Taking care of each other, nurturing each other, teaching each other, taking, taking time to hear one another. That's what God wants us to be. You know, in, in this world, and I, you know, I, I look at, at Vail shaking her head yes, and I know what she does for a profession. She is working with people who are very broken. And we, we look in the world today and what we have gone through in this past year with the isolation has really changed the mental health picture of the entire, of the entire country. And, and can you imagine how much healthier people would be mentally if they felt like somebody cared about them? If they belonged to a community that actually reached out to them, to listen to them, to help them. That's what God wants, is that this would be a place where people would come in and feel like they are important and they have an identity and that they belong. The mental health industry is overwhelmed because people are so isolated, because people are so broken from not being loved. taking care of each other. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, Paul says, love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Jesus said, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul is quoting from uh, the Old Testament here. And what the, how can he say that this is the one law? How can it be summed up? And it's very simple from a logical standpoint. We cannot love our neighbor as ourselves if we don't love God. We first, that's primary, is receiving his love, returning his love in praise and thanksgiving, and then loving our neighbor as ourself. That is the whole heart of community. And then Paul gives this warning. He says, But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. You know, there are people who have refined word attacks to a high art. Being able to put people in their place while smiling. Being able to say things, cutting remarks, and just pass it off by saying something to justify what they did. The Jewish people had ways of making oaths without really meaning what they were saying. And it's still alive today that there are people who can be caustic and acidic and destructive of culture. They can be destructive of the loving culture that God wants us to have. Backbiting, criticism, judgment, all of these destroy community. They take away 
the beauty of what God intended. And you can imagine how God's heart is pierced when he sees unhealthy people doing mean things inside his flock. Because if people come in here expecting to find a community that is loving and accepting, and you have a few people who are able to get in there and say unkind words or do unkind things or are thinking about vengeance and getting back, it really damages the community. But God's love is strong. When you look at the Christian church today, we are the most divided group of followers of Jesus in the world. Other, other religions have maybe two or three divisions, but when you look at the Christian church today in the world, there are literally thousands of denominations and ministries, and each one, to one degree or another, thinks that they have the real way. They think that they have the real religion. And this is a masterstroke of Satan. This is a masterstroke that through history, he has been able to fragment the movement of Jesus Christ in the world. Paul talks about that Christ is the head of the church and we are the body. But when we begin to divide ourselves and, and, and distinguish ourselves from other followers of Jesus, we are not serving the Lord. By His grace, and I believe with all my heart in the last days that there are believers, true believers in every place that under the Holy Spirit we will be drawn together in a unity of purpose. And when we see the darkness in this world today, know that there is an equal and greater reaction in the spirit of light. That in God's Spirit, He is working to bring people together. But we now are one of the most divided in, in the world today, thousands of denominations. The Savior was crucified to end division and to bring unity. And we are not serving Him well within a church if we are subdividing ourselves. You know, it's, it's bad enough in the world, but if it's happening in the church... God forbid. And, you know, <laughs> I want to say, I'm not preaching this because I think this is a huge problem in this congregation because we love it here. We have felt so loved and accepted. And I, I know we are not perfect. I know that we, we have our warts and wrinkles. But I, I have found that this is, this is the most loving church that I could ever be a part of this community. And I'm grateful for that. We will miss you. Trust me. So what if we made our goal to strive for a level of humility and love? What if we made that our focus, to be humble in love and that God would work in us and draw us closer to him? What if, what if we made that our purpose? We could spend time praying that God would make us deeper in love with Him and more in love with one another. That we would make that our primary duty to love others. Paul tells us to be eager to maintain unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So I take that to mean that the Spirit in one spirit, we find unity and are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Friends, we have an imperfect reflection of what God intends for our, for our body, for our believers here that are gathered together. We are imperfect people, but... At the, at the power of God's love, 
is that he can bring us together into a deeper unity and a deeper functionality, a deeper health, and the world around us, outside, will notice. So count the cost of disunity. <laughs> count the cost of disunity when relationships break down, disagreement inevitably follows. And every disagreement between, between Christians is a triumph of Satan. If you descend into disunity, you hand Satan a victory. Maintain peace and deny him the triumph. This is spoken from a negative standpoint, but let's put it into a positive standpoint. It says, be the first to seek peace and reconciliation. You are a Christian today only because God was the first to seek peace with you. Think about that for a moment. You are now called and equipped to be the first to seek after peace and to attempt to pursue and maintain unity. As you do this, you have the high honor of acting as an imitator of God. What a high calling. Think about that. We have the opportunity to be more power-filled as a body by seeking unity, by being peacemakers, by seeking that deeper relationship with God. We have that power. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 shares these words, You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. This is the call that God has for you and for me. Leonard Ravenhill said this. He says, when a fire, when a fire occurs, people run to it. It's the same way in a church. When a church is on fire, you don't have to advertise your church. The community knows it. I remember a little church in Nebraska City had two elderly women. I had two churches at that time, one large one, and then this little church in Nebraska City, two elderly women in there. They had made a vow that they would they would not close that little church as long as they were alive. When I didn't get down there after joining the, that, that district, they wrote a letter to the conference president who apparently had been a student pastor in that church years before. And the president called me up and he said, have you been down to Nebraska City yet? I said, no. He says, you better get down there. So I went down, and there was these two elderly ladies. Every week, they would prepare a lunch in case they got a visitor. And the love for, the love for Jesus was evident in them. <laughs> Arlene Hosher <laughs> and Margaret Givehand. I met them, and there was a young couple that had started going there just two weeks before. They had moved into the area, and the husband, when they were driving away from their lunch with those two elderly women, said, well, we'll never go back there again. And his wife was a beautiful lady, and she said, but Bill, they need us. I heard that story, and they, they so what they, were, what they started doing was they started, they got 12, 25 Bible studies and started going, knocking on doors. I said, did you send out a mailing? No, we're just cold calling on the doors. And I called another couple that I knew with their children and told them what was going on and said, you've got to come here. They were in this little, this little salt box house that had been built in the early 1900s. Within a year and a half, there were 75 to 85 people attending that church. We, had, we were bursting at the seams, filled with children, young couples, people 
We could feel the love. We, we ended up buying a doctor's office after we convinced Mary and Arlene that we needed to buy a new place. We converted that doctor's office into a church. And as we met, there was a lot of wrestling going on over what we should do. And in that group, we came to the resolution, if we can't end up having this church without being friends, we don't want the building. The power of God's love can take an impossible situation with just two elderly women and make a church burst with love and power in the community. And if you don't think that that can happen here, your God is too small. And it's not about the pastor. I admit, God has gifted Cheryl and me, and we love being a part of this. But you understand that this is meant to be a lay movement of people joining together in love. We are only two. You are many. And if you catch the love of Jesus, He is going to send the person here that is going to be that next component that helps to spring this into a bigger life. But you know what? It can happen without a pastor. Because it's about the people. It's about the community. And that is our prayer. Cheryl and I have been praying fervently for whoever will be the next pastor here. Because we want this congregation to be blessed. But when I am sharing this community of love, acceptance, and forgiveness, love, forgiveness, and acceptance, it is preparation. Because I want you to catch a vision of the love of God and what He can do in you and what He can do in this body. Because Christ is the head and we all have direct connection with Him. It doesn't go through the pastor. And there is nothing impossible with God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank You. Thank You for this group. I thank You for this this message that we can share, the power of your love, the good news of your love, that your love transforms us and makes us something otherworldly because we are citizens of heaven waiting for a new heaven and a new earth. We have something important to share. Lord, pour your spirit into us. Make us humble to receive your love and to share it liberally. And we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.
Nothing can change the way you love me. Nothing can change the way I belong to you. Yes, I do. Nothing can separate. Nothing can change the way you love me. Nothing can change the way I belong to you. Yes, I do. Nothing can separate. This is my commandment that you love one another, that you joy. housekeeping. Over at the welcome desk, there are envelopes. If you want to give a love offering to our technology team, an expression, and you have loose cash, just put it in one of those envelopes and mark it for technology. And, that, and put it in the white mailbox. Now, that our love may be full, this is commandment to us. Friends, I pray that by the power of God's love, by his infinite mercy and joy and love poured into us in abundance, I pray that we would go out with bioluminescence, with a light that is, that is more than what we could ever imagine, that we would be attractive that your joy may be full as our joy is full and others come and join us. Lord, bless this gathering. Bless us right down to the tips of our toes that we in turn may be a blessing to others. Let us go out from this place filled with your love and the knowledge that we are yours. God bless you all. Enjoy the day. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.